So yeah, as uh, Yuling said, um, we've only been at this for two months. So um, what I'm presenting today really is um, our initial ideas and concepts, and I welcome you know, your feedback on those. Um, we do have a few initial results. Um, so first I'm going to present, um, just give you a run through of the toilets and the, the technologies that we're planning to use. And then um, I'm going to run through um, some initial, uh, initial literature review we've done on waste characterisation. So I think that might be interesting for some people. Um, as you can see, there is a huge author list, and I am just one of the authors. Um, it's a really interdisciplinary team we've put together at Cranfield to um, address this issue. So, um, yeah, I, I stand here taking all the glory, but there's a lot of people behind that. And also, um, I'm not a specialist in all of these areas, so I will try and explain them and answer your questions as well as I can. Um, so uh, our toilet, which we call the nanomembrane toilet, because uh, not because it uses the nanomembrane specifically, because it's got nanotechnology and membranes in it. Um, so the nanomembrane, techno uh, nanomembrane toilet will accept waste as a mixed stream, so urine and feces combined. Uh, we're planning it for a single household scale. Uh, we're thinking of something like what uh, in the UK we call white goods, but I don't think that translates into all English everywhere, so it's sort of a, a household appliance, like a washing machine, um, where we are going to have an aspirational design to encourage households to purchase this, uh, this product, um, and uh, we'll design it to be odor free as well. So this is uh, just to give you a quick run through of the different uh, parts of the toilet, but I will uh, go into each part in a bit more detail. So um, the feces and urine um, first meet a, uh, a membrane, a low glass transition temperature membrane. Uh, so it's a, a dense membrane. Uh, this allows us to reduce the water content of the waste so that we have a 25% sludge. Uh, the water is uh, absorbed onto not hydrophobic but hydrophilic uh, nano reefs. Um, it's a bit of a theme running through all three presentations this afternoon. Um, so the water uh, and ammonia is absorbed onto these uh, nano beads, um, and then the sludge that's at 25 percent solid concentration will um, be extruded from the, the end of the toilet and will be coated in um, in a polymer, a nano web of polymer, which uh, basically means that you have a briquette that's coated in a polymer uh, that is actually safe to handle. And then with that briquette, you can use it for combustion or fertilizer or whatever you like. Um, so going into a bit more detail, so um, the, the membrane process uh, we're using is called evaporation. And uh, to explain the process of conventional evaporation, what you have is uh, a hollow volume with uh, fibres inside it. And the fibres run the uh, entire length of the, of the shell. Uh, and inside there's a space the mud, uh, inside the fibres, the hollow fibres, and this is known as the lumen. Um, and into and out of the shell, you run uh, the waste stream that you're processing. Um, you then apply a vacuum pressure uh, through the lumen so that there's a vacuum pressure inside uh, these membrane fibers, and you run your waste stream uh, through it. Uh, the difference uh, between this conventional process and what we're proposing is that our membranes, uh, our membrane fibers, will sit directly. Uh, in the holding tank uh, for the waste. Uh, so it'll be a batch process and uh, through this we'll reduce the uh, reduce it to a 25% solid content sludge. Uh, the water vapour that's extracted through this membrane, so it's uh, water and uh, ammonia and uh, some of the other smelly uh, gases, so the um, live weight organic molecules will come through the membrane and they will be condensed on uh, superhydrophilic nanobees. There's various options for that. We could use clay, we could use uh, silica, but we're looking for um, specifically engineered uh, materials uh, to absorb the water uh, and the ammonia. And obviously this will go uh, some way to reducing the odour of the toilet and will uh, design uh, the actual user interface parts uh, with a spring-loaded uh, lid and a rubber gasket to keep all the uh, odours contained. Um, so the, uh, both the uh, membranes and the beads are um, in a cartridge form. 
So uh, we mean we can run them in uh, series uh, or in parallel, and this gives us uh, options for uh, increasing or, de or decreasing the capacity of the process. Or also we could have, for example, beads that absorb particular uh, particular molecules preferentially. So we can have different options. Um, because we're aware that not one size fits all, and uh, although we're designing for one household size, one household is a can be a huge uh, variation in size. Um, and while we're designing these membranes and beads, we're aware that we need to uh, uh, we have physical space constraints, and that we need to keep our energy load use as low as possible. So uh, the waste at 25% uh, solid concentration, uh, the next part of it is uh, to encase it in this uh, polymer. So the way that this, uh, this casing is generated, uh, the, um, the, we have these nano spinnerets which uh, generate a web across them. The, uh, the waste is extruded out of the bottom of the toilet and it goes uh, into, the, into the web, it's pushed on downwards and eventually you have a completely encapsulated briquette. Uh, the material we'll be using for the um, encapsulation, it could be a virgin polymer, and we're even considering using some bactericidal uh, nanoparticles in that polymer to, uh, to add an extra layer of protection. So not only will there be a physical barrier, but um, there will also be these uh, uh, bactericidal uh, particles as well. Or the other option we could, we're going to look at is using um, just normal plastic bags. Those of you who have travelled into um, low income settlements are very familiar that there are a lot of plastic bags in the solid waste and it's actually a big problem. So if we can have a way to recycle them, then uh, that has a, a dual benefit. So this is a view now of looking uh, down, basically the same direction that the uh, briquette will travel and you can see that we have multiple spray heads which operate simultaneously to form the web. And one of our research questions is what is the optimal configuration um, of the number and uh, position of these uh, uh, the spray heads for the optimal, um, the optimal creation of the web and coating. So this is an example of what the web looks like. So the idea is that it's uh, the we'll, the size of the web will be such that it's a bacteria can't, can't pass through, uh, but the water vapor can, so any water vapor that's still left in the briquette at this stage can uh, pass through at a later stage and, and you'll, the briquette will dry with time. So if you're looking for a combustion, then obviously that's going to be an advantage. Uh, the toilet will be maintained, we'll need, uh, uh, this is every six months, to uh, replace the membrane cartridge. The bead cartridge and, and the polymer. Um, the membranes and the beads are not actually consumable, they can be regenerated, but they need to be taken back to a, a central processing facility for regeneration. So, um, the second half of my presentation, I'm just going to take you through um, a literature review. I asked my PhD student to do this literature review. Um, it's probably not the most pleasant literature review ever being set for a student. Uh, and the question really was what is poo? Um, and we really um, wanted to uh, look at the medical literature. There's a, a few kind of odd facts and figures here and there in the sanitation and wastewater literature, but we've really gone and looked at the medical literature and tried to really comprehensively uh, review that uh, to give us some uh, parameters that we can use uh, when we're uh, designing the toilet, and obviously uh, it might be useful for other groups as well. Um, so the first thing we looked at uh, <coughs> is the uh, uh, fecal wet mass and you can see there's a quite a huge variation this depends on uh, diet and race and age so um, there's uh, quite a huge variation um, and we found similar variation in the uh, dry mass as well. <coughs> we found that um, fecal mass uh, did correspond quite positively to uh, fibre intake. Um, 
and also uh, stool frequency compared, uh, compared, uh, correlated with fibre intake as well. We looked at the uh, liquid that was uh, generated um, in, in the waste, so obviously there's both urine and feces. So, um, <coughs> gives you some idea of the volume of urine and the water content of it. And the other liquid in, uh, inputs, which obviously are the water in the stools, the water in the urine, but also uh, there may be uh, anal cleansing water and poor flush toilet water as well. <coughs> we looked at the uh, solid inputs, um, so obviously these come from uh, the stool and the urine. It's interesting that in some cases you could actually get a greater solid input from urine than you could from the stools. Um, any uh, anal wiping material, uh, urinary wiping material and menstrual pads are also potentially solid uh, inputs into your toilet. Um, and we also looked at the mean water content of feces, which again is uh, quite highly variable. Uh, we found that uh, feces are predominantly proteins, fats, carbohydrates and fibres, and we've got some data on the variation in those. Um, and we also looked at the chemical nature of feces, particularly the uh, chemical oxygen demand and the biological oxygen demand. And again, there's um, quite some variation. And finally, uh, we looked at the physical nature and of uh, the feces. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the uh, Bristol stool charts, a particular favourite around Cranfield. One of my colleagues has even got it on the mug. Um, so the uh, Bristol stool chart defines different types of stools from things that are really quite uh, solid and hard through to um, very watery diarrhea. Um, and you can see, uh, we, have, we looked at two studies from this in Iran and the UK, and you can see most people are having uh, stools maybe in the middle, around three or four. But obviously this is only two, two countries, Iran and the UK, so I think there's uh, a really interesting uh, area of research here. And we found um, one of the papers commented that the stool form is due to the transit time in the intestine. Um, so that's all I have to uh, present today. Um, do keep, if you want to follow our project, we do have a website and a Twitter feed. Um, but I'd be really interested to hear uh, your opinions on what we're doing, because like I said, we're really, really um, at the start of our journey to reinvent the toilets. <laughs>